Welcome back. Today um, I will talk about regression analysis. Um, I will cover first correlation and scatter plots. Then I explain without going into any theory um, how um, OLS works. OLS stands for um, ordinary least squares. Then we move into starter. I give you um, a hands-on experience um, about how to analyze um, data and then how to conduct your first regression analysis. We will discuss finally the interpretation of the output you obtain. We visualize the output um, and then we talk about assumptions and this will lead to lecture for um, post-estimation analysis. You find all the details on GitHub, the data, the code, um, any other material you might like to use. Also, I have some timestamps um, further below in the descriptions if you want to um, you just jump between different sessions. All right, let's go um, into it. Um, first point um, is to look at um, correlations and scatter plots. Um, very often people um, overlook this part and they jump straight um, into a regression analysis. However, very frequently you um, identify problems just by looking at your data. So for that purpose, looking at a scatter plot can actually give you some visual insights into data structures. A few examples. Number one, you might be able to identify outliers. Outliers, we discussed it in a previous um, session, um, can to some extent affect your abilities to analyze your data, depending on how many there are. You also might be able to already visualize that the relationship you try to capture is in fact not a linear relationship. Again, in a previous session, we talked about linear relationships. This is what we tend to assume. Again, of course, the issue there is it works quite well under certain assumptions if you don't make very significant changes to your variables. Good, so for me, that's important to note. Apart from the scatter plot, and I'll show you an example in a minute, looking at a correlation matrix um, is insightful because you can just look through your whole data and um, see what what are possible relationships that might might maybe require some further analysis now in this example um, we look at um, the um, household survey which we used in a, in a previous uh, lecture so here we focus on income, credit card loans, the size of a household, number of children, and whether um, a household contributes to a private pension. And as you can see, it's not a big surprise that um, certain variables are highly correlated. Now in terms of correlation, the correlation coefficient um, takes values between minus one, which is a perfect negative relationship, and plus one, which is a perfect positive relationship, and any values in between. So usually we would um, talk about um, a meaningful relationship in the sense of a statistical relationship if this correlation coefficient in absolute value is in excess of 0.85. So it could be either negative 0.85 or positive 0.85. Now looking at, at this matrix here, you note a few points. Number one, there is um, the main diagonal just running um, through here. Um, and this always takes the value one. So this is simply the correlation with yourself. Obviously that's a perfect correlation. And also I, I left um, the um, upper um, corner empty because this is just repeating the values because the correlation between income and credit card is the same compared to credit card and income. Yeah, you can always switch, switch them. It doesn't affect um, the correlation coefficient. 
Now, looking at that, um, you see obviously a positive relationship um, between uh, household size and number of children, but this is simply by default. This is how we calculate household size. There are relationships, but they seem to be quite weak. Certainly, there's an, an income pension relationship, so households with higher income levels are more likely to contribute to a private pension. Again, it's not a big surprise. So that's an interesting way just to explore your whole data set and see are there any relationships that you might like to study further using um, a, a regression analysis. Looking at a scatter plot can give you some first insights into relationships. Now, looking at this scatter plot between um, income and credit card loans, again, they have been transformed. Um, we, we talked about transformations in a previous session. Um, you more or less see nothing. There is um, a, a huge degree of randomness to it. You don't see any clear pattern. So it does not go up, which would indicate a positive relationship. It doesn't go down, which would indicate a negative relationship. It's kind of really all over the place. So there is no obvious relationship in this case. So by exploring um, these scatter plots, you could already, before you conduct any further analysis, exclude certain relationships because the evidence would not support that. Distributions, we covered this um, in a previous session in more detail. Um, I would definitely have a look at, um, at the distributions. It's important to note um, that you do not have to have a normal distribution for all your variables prior to regression analysis. This is not um, a precondition for conducting a regression. Very often people believe this is the case, but it's not true still have a look at the distributions. Yeah, Maybe a transformation might make sense, which we discussed um, in a, a previous session. Now, um, what we um, have to have in mind is when we talk about regressions, we talk about um, a, a linear model. A linear model um, is, of course, a simplification. So we have to be aware that actually what we do here is it is a model. It's not really reality. It's an approximation of reality. Now, when I write down this equation here, on the left-hand side, it would be my credit card loan. Um, this would be the dependent variable. So that's the variable I try to explain. On the right-hand side, I have several independent variables, including income, pension contributions, the size of the household, number of children, and then I also add an error term to it, the epsilon i. We will talk about underlying assumptions in, in the next session in a lot more detail. Now, the idea of this linear model is that I believe that there is a linear relationship linking the right-hand side variables to the left-hand side variable. This also implies a certain level of causal relationship, but be always careful we don't actually, and we cannot explicitly in this context, um, assume and test for causality. Yeah? It's an assumption we put in. There are ways to, to talk about this more depending on, on your setting, um, and I will explore this in, in future sessions. Again, if you have any questions, just leave a comment below. Um, I can always make some more content um, trying to answer um, your questions. Apart from that, you notice coefficients. Yeah, So this is, um, in this case, the um, constant term, the alpha, the slope coefficient, beta, gamma, and so on. There are two gammas, which is not correct, so that you ignore. Um, that should be updated, should be a different coefficient, except you explicitly want to um, constrain your coefficient, which I actually don't intend. Now, these coefficients, they measure the extent of this relationship. We already looked at, at these in, in previous um, sessions, um, and now our attempt is to try to estimate these coefficients using what we call um, an OLS estimation. OLS stands for Ordinary Least Squares, and I now give you um, a more or less hopefully intuitive explanation of what we try to achieve. 
Again, I don't go into theory. So we say always no to theory. We don't go into it. I'm more than happy to do um, another video on the theory of OLS and really going into the nitty gritty. But this would require, if you want to do it properly, um, an introduction to linear um, algebra and some statistics. Um, honestly, if you just want to use um, regressions, you don't really have to know all the details. It's a bit like, you know, driving a car. You don't have to be able to build your own car to drive one. Okay. So, but if you want to know more, I'm more than happy um, to um, do another video, assuming there is enough demand for it, because at the moment, um, only my mother's mother watches all the videos and she doesn't even speak English. But at least she's um, watching. Yeah, thank you, mom. Excellent. Keep watching. All right, OLS. So what's the idea behind um, OLS? Um, um, ordinarily squares um, is um, a method to um, think about um, a, a best fit um, among, um, among many possible ways of fitting data. So what OLS does, as a matter of fact, is it defines what you call a loss function. So um, what's the mistake I make if I, um, if I put in this particular um, linear relationship? That is the idea of OLS. And in this particular case, the loss function focuses on the sum of squared mistakes, which we call residuals. And our, our aim is to minimize the sum of squared residuals. Yeah, so minimizing the sum of squared mistakes. Now, you can, of course, ask yourself, why do we exactly do that? Are there other ways of doing it? And the answer is, yes, there are. There are plenty of other ways of um, thinking about loss functions that do not use um, the squared mistake. Now, this is just to visualize it. And I think it's quite, um, quite helpful. So, when you look at a scatter plot, and if a scatter plot in fact reveals um, something like this, you would um, in fact assume there is a negative relationship between these two variables. You would assume that if you increase x by a certain amount, um, that y tends to be lower. Yeah. If you um, decrease x, you would assume that y tends to be higher. So there seems to be a negative relationship. Now, when you look at um, this blue line, of course, we are just speculating at the moment. This blue line fits certain observations in the scatter plot quite well. Yeah, so some are maybe even on the line. However, um, other observations uh, are away from that line. Um, and you see that indicated here with the vertical distance between um, the blue line and the actual observation. And these deviations from the line, so from the expected relationship or the so-called fitted value, this is the error you make. And the error we, we make, we call this a residual. A residual is an estimate of this error. So when you think about this before, when we talked about um, adding the error term to our models, um, this is actually um, what we mean by it. Of course, the error term is, is something conceptual. We can't explicitly observe it. What we can observe is the errors we make. And these errors we call the residual. So how do we get to this um, residual? So the idea is as follows. You take the value of x of this observation up here, which is um, down there. You go from this value of x to the blue line and so based on your estimated relationship, you would assume that the value of y is um, on that level. However, as you can see, the true value of y is above that. Yeah. So put differently, the model you estimate understates the true value of y. So you make a mistake, which I indicate um, with this vert um, um, vertical um, distance. And so what, what we do with OLS is we take these mistakes um, and we um, put this to the power of 2. Now, of course, you can ask why power of 2. Now, um, there are um, two things that are happening. Number one, if you only look at the vertical distance and you do not um, take it to the power of 2, you might sometimes overstate and sometimes you understate. Yeah? So in this case, we understate the true value of y for a given x. 
but sometimes we actually overstate, like in this case here, um, the value of y for a given x. So if you just look at the mistake without taking this to the power of 2, the negative mistakes and the positive mistakes, they would just cancel out. Yeah, Which is a different way of fitting. It's not quite what we um, intend to do. So by taking um, as, as, um, the uh, power of 2, the negative values become positive. Yeah? And the positive values become even more positive. The other effect you have is that um, small mistakes are not as significant compared to bigger mistakes. Because once you take something to the power of 2, the larger mistakes be will be an awful lot higher than the smaller mistake. It's, it's not linear. Yeah? The loss is not linear in this case. So put differently, OLS will punish you a lot if you make a large mistake. And that is also the reason why outliers um, are really important. Yeah? Because one outlier, so one observation somewhere out here, has a very substantial impact on the line of best fit if you use OLS. Yeah? So that's the idea behind OLS. Um, so summarizing it, it's a loss function. We look at the sum of squared residuals. We try to minimize the sum of squared residuals using um, our um, optimal fit. This line, as a matter of fact, or if you go into higher dimension, the plane um, is, is determined by its coefficients. So um, by selecting the perfect line, we actually select the coefficients. Yeah? So put differently, when we talk about OLS estimation, what we do is we find the coefficients, the intercept, the slope coefficient that give me the perfect line that minimizes the sum of squared residuals. So that's the idea behind it. Great. Good. So now what we do is we move into starter and we start playing with some data. So here we are. I um, go into starter. I um, opened a do file and I'm ready to work. I, I put the data into a folder. You see that here. And um, I just open the data set. Um, it's in a um, comma separated uh, format, so a CSV file. Um, we talked about data input before, but you should be able to follow if you haven't seen that. So in here, we have um, some data on repossessions of um, property. So this is when a bank demands um, a property back if someone can't pay the mortgage. Um, and GDP per capita. This is UK data uh, starting in 1987 going up to um, 2020. If you want to know more about the data and how to get the data, um, I will put links um, in, into the description. So the data on mortgages and repossessions comes from um, government statistics, which you can download for free. Um, and GDP per capita data comes from um, the World Bank, World Development Indicators, which again you can obtain for free. So I just combine these two into my data set, which anyway is available on GitHub. But if you want to add more stuff to it, um, please feel free to do so. All right. Now I move into um, the starter do file. The first thing I, I quite like to do is I, I want to change my directory, go into the working directory um, and start uh, then um, um, getting the data into starter. Okay, so that's the first task. I just put the asterisk here to make some comments. I like to do some separators, it's up to you. And I just call this regression here. This is what we want to do. So I make life a little bit more colorful. Um, I will save that now in the target folder. I just call this fun. So that's my fun do file. Um, I will zoom a bit so it will be a lot easier for you to see that and also for older people including myself. Good, so the first thing I want to do is I want to change directory. So I use the cd command. Um, so I go in here and click up there and I get my path. That's a quick way of doing it. You just copy paste that and go back into the do file, copy paste that in. 
and we just put now some quotation marks here we are and we have our change directory command the next thing we want is we want to get the data so um, basically what I do here is I import data so I make a comment here um, and we have seen this in, in previous um, sessions we use the in sheet command because we have a CSV um, file and then using is the keyword and then we have to specify the name of the file I go back to the folder um, I do a right click on it rename and copy paste the name including the extension go back to my do file copy paste that in and I have my um, in sheet command done and um, I suggest um, to use the option clear to get rid of any data in memory so just in case you want to rerun this otherwise you end up with an error message good so that's the first step let me just run this and see what happens okay that's interesting so you get um, a few variables um, loaded um, so I recommend you do a BR you browse your data um, and um, it looks all right so um, all these um, first um, columns look fine so the color indicates um, that it's numeric which is good so this is what we want and then funny enough there are some um, empty columns also imported so this is a bit odd this um, might be because of um, the, the way you um, copied the data into your into your spreadsheet um, I would like to get rid of these um, V um, variables because there are lots of them um, so to avoid typing out v, v4, um, v5 and so on you can use something which you call a wildcard so if you have done some Linux you will be very used to that terminology so what I do here is I simply use now a drop command to get rid of it and I put in V and just the asterisk so it will remove all variables that start with V so I, I don't have to you know um, specify each and every in in detail so that should work and um, off they go so they're all gone so that's pretty nice good so that would be my, my first thing to do the next thing I would um, usually do is I want to visualize the data yeah so we, we, we spoke about um, um, data sources we spoke about data types obviously in this setting we have time series data because we observe repossessions over time and GDP per capita over time so to visualize um, these two different time series the obvious thing to do is to use a line chart and what I can do is I can combine line charts using the two-way command yeah so I would simply now do some line charts just to see how do these um, two different um, time series look like yeah so I do a two-way and then there are different ways you can do it I personally like to put stuff into brackets because it gives it a nice structure um, line is the keyword for your line chart um, and then you have to look at the names of your variables I think it's repossession usually I always make a sp spelling error here and I plot this over time which is a year in this case um, and I do another line chart where I do the GDP per capita PC also over time and I can just run this one more time and see what happens and you see now um, a, a line chart is popped out um, which is maybe not yet perfect yeah, we have to optimize this a bit so this is just our first attempt the first thing which is a bit irritating and this is very typical for starter starter um, does not um, um, start uh, where you want it to start you see here 1980 it starts but actually our data starts in 87 this is because um, this is the way um, it, it labels um, the um, horizontal axis yeah so we um, should optimize that so I would like to start in, in 87 and then I go, go up um, to 2020 the other thing which might be useful is it might be useful to have two different um, vertical axes for these two different time series because they are measured very differently 
So otherwise it might be difficult to actually compare these two. Yeah, so these are the two things I want to fix first. Okay, so how can we do this? Um, I can simply specify here as an option using the comma to start. The option, um, I can specify y-axis and I give it a number. So it's y-axis 1. I do something similar for the second line chart and here I just specify, to be careful with my brackets, um, y-axis 2. So that would put it on different y-axis and then I um, do some overall additional options. So I, I introduce here the option using the comma um, and then I could um, um, you know, change the labels. So I, I change the X label in this case in brackets um, I would um, have a starting point um, 1987. I have a step um, which is in, in this case uh, maybe three years. I have to see how it looks like and I go up to um, 2020 and I just run this now one more time. So let me just run this one more time and see what happens. Now this is better. Yeah, so now you have the possessions here on, on this axis. You have GDP per capita on that one, so it's um, it's it's easier to see. You certainly can ar can argue in in this recession here. So when when the GDP per capita dips, you have a huge spike of repossessions. Yeah, and then you have a long decline, which coincides with a strong increase in GDP per capita. Then you have the next recession. So this is the global financial crisis, and you see another spike here of repossessions. It's quite funny to see actually that repossessions started increasing way before the recession, which is interesting. So if you could have observed the increase in repossessions, um, you might have been able to get out of the stock market at the right time. And then you see a further increase, repossessions drop again, and then of course that's COVID. Yeah? The funny thing is um, in COVID, you don't see the increase in repossessions whatsoever. And this is because of um, government intervention. Yeah? The government uh, simply banned repossessions because, of course, it affects um, massively um, the, the ways we could um, self-isolate if you don't have a home to self-isolate in. Yeah? So this was government intervention that did not lead to a, to a spike in repossessions. So looking at this, it might be interesting to convert um, the time series into growth rates, into the change, and we would speculate that a decline in GDP per capita would lead to an increase in repossessions. Yeah? So that would be the first impression you would get out of this. We could now modify this a little bit further. So um, um, once um, a line gets a bit too long, I recommend you do a line um, break using the backslash. Yeah, you need for that um, one, two, three backslashes. We can break it. Yeah. So um, I want to make things a little bit nicer. Um, the first thing that I might like to do is I want to maybe add a title to it. Yeah. So we add a title to this um, in quotation marks to indicate it's a string. Um, I might call this repossessions and GDP per capita. Yeah, let's do something like that. You also might like to have a legend. Um, so that's useful. Otherwise, you might not know what is what. And we just do um, some labels in here. So we have a label and we might do a, a label. The first label, label one, should be um, our repossessions. We might do a capital letter here. Then we do another label in here, which would be our label 2. And I call this then GDP per capita. I close this and I close that. So always be careful with your um, brackets. It's easy to forget one. It will otherwise complain. Okay, so we have done this. I do another line break here. And I might throw in also a note below um, just to indicate data sources. Yeah, so I just say source here. And um, one is World Bank and other one is basically um, a UK government report. Yeah, so that's it.
The other thing I, I might like to do is I might change the color of the second one. So I can go in here, do color, and I might do maybe red. Let's do that. Good. Um, let's, let's run this one more time and see whether we made some mistakes. No, actually we didn't. Surprise, surprise. Now we have um, here a title, repossessions and GDP per capita. We have the red um, line chart for GDP per capita and we have repossessions. We have the source displayed below and we have um, some, yeah, some legend as well. So actually it's looking quite fine. So this is almost um, all right for for publication. If you're happy with that, you can just now save it um, and you can move it um, into um, other applications. Usually the best to do is to save it as a portable network um, graphic. Um, that works quite well. You can, you can import this into, um, into Word um, or um, into LaTeX depending on, on what you want to use. Yeah, so that's looking already quite nice. Good. So we have done a, a good amount of work. Um, so we visualized it a bit. The next thing I would like to do is I would actually like to go into growth rates. So I want to convert this into growth rates. The easiest way to do this is to um, declare the time dimension using the tset command. So tset year now tells Starter that we actually have a time series because thus far Starter doesn't know what we mean by year. We did not specify any uh, any type that would suggest that we have um, a time dimension. Good. So once Starter knows that I can now use um, the time series operators for calculations, in particular the first difference operator D, and the leg operator L. The first difference operator is simply taking the value of um, your variable at point in time t minus the value in point in time t minus 1. The leg operator refers to the previous period. It's t minus 1. So if I want to have the growth rate of repossessions, I just call this rep underscore g for growth rate, I could do d dot repossession yeah, just copy paste that from above. So the change in repossessions divided by the lect value of repossessions. So that would do it. I strongly recommend if you create new variables to label them, otherwise you will forget. So I do label var for label for a variable. I take the name of the variable and then in quotation marks I specify what this um, is. So here we have annual growth rates or annual growth um, in repossessions. Yeah, I can copy paste. I'm lazy in repossessions. Good. Now we do something similar um, for GDP um, and we just call this GDP GDP and growth here. So we just do this. Just copy paste that um, and we take GDP per capita and we just do exactly the same in terms of changes. So we do um, the change in GDP divided by the previous change which gives you um, a percentage growth rate and we just call this the annual um, GDP per capita growth and we have the label. Okay. Good, so let's just run this one more time. We again get our figure, which is all nice. Um, and in here, we should now have our growth rates. And if you hit DES, you see um, our labels. So now we know what these things are. So that, that's quite helpful. Um, good, so we are done with that. Um, the next thing which might be useful, um, as we discussed um, on the slides, is looking at a scatter plot because it, it gives you a nice visualization of this relationship and you will be able potentially to spot outliers. How do we do this? Scatter command. Yeah, We take um, here on our y-axis your repossession growth and you take your GDP per capita growth rate and we just visualize that and run it. Okay. Now what you notice here is it actually is really, really nice. It's interesting. So number one, um, there is a tendency that higher GDP growth rates 
would reduce the growth in repossessions. Now this is something we already saw, you know, when we visualized it. You also see definitely one big outlier here. Yeah, so that is a problem. This will affect your um, your ability to um, run a regression analysis because this outlier here, because it's so far away from all the others, will have a huge impact um, on this um, regression line because as we discussed before, OLS takes the squared deviation. So that is huge, this impact. Yeah, so we have to take care of this. Now, there are many different ways to do this. One way is to simply kick out this observation. I wouldn't do it personally. Another way is to, to basically introduce um, a dummy variable to highlight that this is a, a particular problem in the data. Well, we know it's COVID and we know there was a policy intervention um, which ensured that repossessions did not increase. Yeah. So this is what we do. The first thing I want to do is I want to illustrate what is going on here by doing this plot again, but now using an if condition to remove the last year. So if year is not equal to, so this exclamation um, mark equal to is not equal to 2020. So what that does is it removes the one case where um, we uh, have the COVID year, which is 2020. Yes, if you run this um, again, you see now it's much better. Now, of course, you could argue there's another significant drop here. I think this is the global financial crisis. But of course, you have to be then mindful how many of these um, would you classify as outliers. You also note that there are actually um, uh, four points here where you have negative growth. So these are actually the recessions. So it might be interesting maybe to label recessions um, separately, again, maybe using a dummy variable and see whether recessions would um, deserve special treatment in your regression analysis. Good. Finally, we do um, correlations. So we just look at correlations just to get a feeling, you know, how um, is this relationship so is our suspicion um, correct, it's negative or not? Correlation is simply core and then the two variables in our case and we just run this and um, we check the output and here we see a negative relationship. You see it's quite weak. So when we spoke about correlations, we said it's between minus one and one. We said that in absolute value, it should be um, above roughly um, 0.85. So this is quite small. So it doesn't look, um, it doesn't look as if there is a strong relationship. But again, this might be influenced by your outliers. Yeah. Good, so we have done now all um, the um, exploration of your data. We know potentially there are outliers. One source of outliers are potentially recessions. So time periods where GDP per capita um, went down. One other source most likely is the COVID phase. Okay, so this is important to note. Let's do a regression. Okay, so I do rec here and I try to explain my repossessions using GDP growth rates. So I'll run this first and see what, what happens. Okay, so I'm running this. And now we see a regression output. Yeah. Now, how to interpret that? What do we get out of it? Yeah, it looks initially totally overwhelming. So how to read it? Number one. The first thing you note is number of observations. We have 33, which is not very big. It's a very small data set. So usually I would um, be reluctant to run regressions below um, about 30 observations because it's, it's getting quite difficult and there are reasons for that. I will do a special video on this um, because there are reasons which are linked to what you call degrees of freedom which is a bit complicated to explain, but I will do a special video on that. Then you see the F test. Uh, the F test um, tests the joint hypothesis that all the coefficients in the model are jointly equal to zero. Now, what does that mean? It means it takes the constant term, so this is your alpha, the constant term, which is your intercept coefficient, 
and the slope coefficient, so that's your beta in the equation, and assumes that they are both equal to zero. If you cannot reject this um, null hypothesis, it basically means that the model as a whole explains nothing. Yeah? Because if both coefficients are equal to zero, it basically means there is no relationship, there is nothing you can use. Now this line here gives you a so-called um, probability um, that um, that um, this can can be um, um, that this actually is is the case. So it's equal to zero. So this is called a, a, a p-value. That's a p-value linked to your f-test. Now, um, in terms of interpretation, if the, this p-value is above 0.05, you can argue that with 95% level of confidence, um, you um, can reject um, the null hypothesis. Of course, we are way above 0.05, so actually you cannot reject the null hypothesis. So again, in this case, the f-test states is a null hypothesis, so this is your your starting point, so to speak, that all the coefficients are equal to zero. This p-value associated to your f-test is um, way above 0 0.05, which means I cannot reject this hypothesis. Now that means that uh, the model as a whole has no explanatory power. It explains nothing. Now the R squared um, actually confirms that. Yeah? The R squared, um, in terms of interpretation, um, would um, tell you how much of the observed variability of your dependent variable can be explained by the model. Yeah? In this case, it's less than 1%. Yeah? It's, it's nothing. You explain nothing. The adjusted R squared is something which um, we um, cover in a separate um, video when we talk about degrees of freedom. Yeah, so we have to um, leave it for the time being. Now, when you look at the coefficients, you um, first of all note it's a negative coefficient. So in line with what you would expect, um, if you increase your GDP uh, per capita growth rate, you should see a decrease in your repossessions. Yeah? However, however, looking at your p-value, you are way above 0 0.05. Yeah? So I will focus mostly on p-values. We can do it differently and I'll show you in a minute how to do it differently. So again, if the p-value is below 0 0.05, you can reject the null hypothesis with 95% level of confidence. Now again, in this case, the null hypothesis is that this coefficient is equal to 0. Now, what's the difference between the test we do on this line and the F-test? The F-test is a joint hypothesis test. It jointly assumes in the null hypothesis that this coefficient here and the one below are both equal to zero. It's a joint hypothesis test. The test here, which you call the T-test, is a single hypothesis test. Maybe test as a null hypothesis that this coefficient is equal to zero. We can only recheck that if the p-value is below 0 0.05 if we take a 95% level of confidence. Now, if you ask me what is a good level of confidence, the convention is to take 95% and to go higher than that. So in publications, you take 95% and then you, you report 99% and 99.9%, which is pretty damn certain. Good. So when you look at the constant term, again, you see the p-value is above 0 0.05. So again, you cannot recheck the null that this coefficient is equal to 0, which means looking at our regression model, we uh, conclude we explain nothing. There's another way to look at the coefficients. There are two more ways. One is to look at the t-statistic. Now, I don't talk about theory here. Again, I don't talk about how this is calculated, but just um, what you need to take away is that if the, this t-statistic is approximately um, two in absolute value, it would be seen as a significant coefficient, which means that the coefficient is significantly different from zero.
So the T value and the P value, they are perfectly related. Yeah. So um, if you um, have a P value below 0 0.05, you will see a T value, an absolute value above 1.96. So it's a bit, bit below two. Yeah. The other thing you can do is you can look at the confidence interval. Yeah. So that's another way of hypothesis testing. So here, what that means is that with 95% confidence, you would assume that the true relationship, which is captured by this coefficient between repossession growth and GDP per capita growth is between minus 6.61 and plus 5.23. What you note is this is a huge interval. Look at the coefficient value. This is somewhere in, in the middle of it. It's a huge interval. And most importantly, this co confidence interval includes zero, which means that um, you cannot say that the coefficient is different from zero because zero is part of your confidence interval. That's another way of hypothesis testing, which you call the duality principle. But again, you don't really need this. It's enough to look at the p-values. And again, here, um, what we look for is 0 0.05. Then we talk about 95% level of confidence. Or 0 0.01, we talk then about 99% level of confidence. So if you're really, really very, very um, you know, damn certain, we look at 0 0.001, which is 99.9% .9 level of confidence. Yeah, so what, what you do here is you always permit, um, to some extent, um, of course, mistakes. And yeah, there are different types of mistakes, but that's enough at this point for you to know. Good, so this initial model tells me that actually we explain nothing. But we already know, and this is why it is so important, looking at our scatter plot, that it's very, very likely that outliers do affect this outcome. So what I do next is I specify dummy variables. I will do two dummies. The first one is a recession dummy. Yeah, recession. And there are two different ways to specify dummies. I, I showed you one way. I show you now another way. So I can do the following. Um, I specify a condition which is that my GDP per capita growth rate is negative. So whenever my GDP per capita growth rate um, is negative, this recession dummy takes value one, otherwise zero. So I can do it in one line. In previous sessions, what I have done is I basically did the following. I explicitly wrote this out with an if statement. Yeah. And then I did a replace statement, which is basically an else statement. If recession is a missing value, which is coded as equal to equal to dot. Yeah, you have seen that before in previous sessions. So the same I can do in one line. Yeah, using the condition. Basically, this is like it's like a so-called Boolean. Um, but we don't necessarily need to um, go into this in further detail. Just comment this out, otherwise it will complain because I already generated recession. So that gives me a recession dummy. The other dummy I want is a COVID dummy. Let's do a COVID dummy. And basically the COVID dummy takes value one in the last year. So if year is equal to equal to 2020. And then what I do is I run regressions again. Yeah, I run a regression here with my recession dummy and see what happens. Okay, so I now just run this whole thing one more time. So it's all done. Everything is done. And I get another output. Yeah, so that's the second table. And when you compare this, you see now that the F test is getting a little bit better. The p-value of the f-test is still not below 0 0.05. So again, it's not a great model. You can explain a tiny little bit more, around 5% of the observed variability of your dependent variable. But this is not great either. And looking at the coefficients, look at the p-values. None of these p-values is below 0 0.05. So throwing in the, the recession um, dummy doesn't really fix it. Okay, it doesn't really fix it. Good. Now, the next thing we try is we try COVID. 
Yeah, because we know COVID had a significant impact and also there was a government intervention and that might actually explain a lot. So I run this for COVID. Okay, and look at this. What a difference. Yeah, now you see the F test is much larger than before. That's the F test statistic. The associated p-value is now below 0 0.05. Now that means that I can reject the joint hypothesis that all these three coefficients are jointly equal to zero. I can reject it with 95% level of confidence. Now the R squared is now 20% or 21%. And the one we actually have to use for interpretation, and I talk about this in a separate video, when we talk about degrees of freedom, is 16%. So that means so after adjusting for degrees of freedom, um, you can explain 16% of your observed growth in repossessions looking at the um, GDP per capita growth rate and looking at the COVID intervention. Now, actually, this is quite good. It's a very, very simple model. Yeah, We don't do much. We have a very small sample. So that's actually quite useful. Now, looking at the coefficients, you see that... Um, the GDP per capita um, growth rate is now significant. Again, the p-value is below 0 0.05. So again, I can say with 95% level of confidence, I can recheck the null that this coefficient is equal to zero. Looking at the t-value, the t-value is above two in absolute value at minus 2.28. So again, it's the same story. I can recheck the null. Looking at uh, the confidence interval, you see the zero is not part of a confidence interval because it starts at minus 17, it goes up to minus 0 0.95, but the zero is not included. So again, it's duality principle of hypothesis testing. You can reject the null that zero is part of it. So we know that GDP per capita has a significant and negative um, impact on repossession growth. Looking at COVID, it's a special case. Yeah, COVID is a special case. It's definitely significant. It definitely had an impact. Um, but of course, it, it's, it's our outlier. So basically what we do here is we, we flag up this outlier, which actually is, is messing up our, our whole analysis. Yeah, the constant term itself is only significant on a 90% level of uh, confidence because um, the p-value is below um, 0.1 but above 0.05. Yeah, so that would be a marginal case. But anyway, the constant term is only there for um, completeness of a model. It doesn't give me much insight, um, so we can, in fact, um, quite often actually ignore this. You can also get rid of it totally if you simply adjust um, um, the um, variables um, for their means. You can also get, get rid of it. Good. The final thing I want to do um, is I, I want to try and um, basically um, predict um, now um, my my model. Yeah. So after you run your regression, what you could do is you can start predicting fitted values. Yeah. So we can basically get predictions out of it, and this is now where the fun starts. Also in terms of industry applications. So what you do is after your regression, you, you put a, a predict command and I just call this, I call this fit. And the default would be um, basically doing the fitted values. And then we could visualize it um, doing another two-way chart. So we do a two-way chart where we just take our scatter plot from above. Let's do that, the scatter plot from above. And then we do um, a line chart here with our fitted data, which of course will vary with our independent variable. So that's the one. And I um, get rid of um, the COVID year because we know there is um, the COVID impact, so I just get rid of it. So if year is not equal to um, 2020, again, exclamation mark equal to means it's not equal to. So I can do this. Uh, I run this one more time. And now you have um, this lovely output. You see here the outlier. So that's flagged up with a dummy variable. That's a separate case. Um, and then we see um, this relationship. And it's actually looking quite good. It's a negative significant relationship. Um, and we are done 
for this analysis. Yeah, so that I think was um, hopefully interesting. Um, so again, you find all the code on GitHub. Um, just play around yourself. Um, you, of course, should then work on your own data and your own problems. And let me know in the comments below um, how things are going. Good. So we have done this. Um, we talked about interpretation of um, um, of these um, regression outputs. Again, on the slides, you have all the information um, written down. So if you missed some of this, it's all there. Um, again, if you have any questions, just please leave a, a comment below. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you fancy more content um, around data science, data analysis. Um, we covered all these aspects. We talked about the R squared. We talked about the adjusted R squared. I promise you I will do a separate um, little video on the difference between the R squared adjusted R squared, which is uh, related to degrees of freedom. Um, functional forms, I covered this already um, in the, um, the video on transformations. So I will leave it there. I just will do a, a few more seconds um, on assumptions. Yeah, I haven't spoken about this, but this is in fact what will be discussed in lecture four, post-estimation analysis in a lot of detail. Because I can guarantee you that the assumptions you implicitly make when using a classical linear regression model. So this is what we have done. It's a linear model. We use our OLS standard assumptions. Yeah. So whenever you do that, it's very likely that some of the assumptions which are listed here are violated. Yeah. I don't go into the details here. I will do this in the next lecture. But just to note, it's uh, what we have done thus far is to focus on what it is, yeah, an intuitive understanding of what a regression analysis does, how to do it in starter, how to interpret the output. We make a ton of assumptions and we have to dismantle all these assumptions in detail in the next session. I see you then.